Hello again. I'm Derek. Uh, I don't have May with me tonight, but uh, she's at work. I'm going ahead with a series of comments on evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. So I started this uh, recently, started off by making some observations about uh, the question of whether we could recommend uh, the biblical accounts as evidence of Jesus's resurrection to someone who was not already a believer, who didn't necessarily believe the Bible was God's word, didn't already uh, believe the gospel, but were open to uh, looking at evidence and open to the possibility of belief. So uh, after, uh, after addressing that question, and I believe that we should be able to uh, offer that evidence, uh, we started off by doing uh, a, a quick survey or beginning a quick survey of our biblical material related to the resurrection of Jesus. And we started off with Paul's uh, comments in uh, the letter of 1 Corinthians. So we're going to continue. We left off in the Gospel of Luke, Luke's account of uh, the resurrection appearances of Jesus. So let's pray to get started. Father, we thank you that we have this time to look into the scriptures uh, when considering this uh, question of evidence for the resurrection of your son, please guide us by your Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, which you provide through him. And in his name we pray. Amen. All right. So uh, we uh, decided just to um, read through the different uh, passages related to the resurrection in the New Testament, starting with 1 Corinthians 15, then we just started with the first gospel with Matthew, then Mark. Uh, we ended up in Luke last time in Luke chapter 24. Uh, we had not uh, finished that. Um, what I would like you to do as we move through these passages, I said, is to form a little uh, kind of a snapshot or a little capsule with the main points of each passage. So in 1 Corinthians, you remember that Paul said that he was handing on to the Corinthians what he'd already received. Uh, that's because, uh, or you know, meaning what he had been taught. And that's because Paul was not with Jesus. He was not one of the 12 apostles who accompanied Jesus on his ministry. He wasn't a, a witness to uh, Jesus's uh, trial or his crucifixion, and he only came, became a witness to Jesus' resurrection uh, uh, quite some time after the apostles were. Um, so uh, Paul's uh, not in a position to say that, uh, you know, that, that he was with Jesus or that he was with the apostles when they were witnesses. But he does say that Jesus died, was buried, raised, and then seen by the apostles and some others finally seen by himself. Okay, so that's Paul's account. It's our oldest known uh, written information about the resurrection uh, of Jesus. Um, in Matthew, we had women going to the tomb, women that were not mentioned by Paul, uh, women disciples of Jesus. They were given a message to tell the disciples to go to Galilee and there they would see Jesus. The women also themselves actually see the risen Jesus uh, on their way to deliver this message. They deliver it. The disciples go to Galilee and indeed do uh, and indeed do see the risen Jesus in Galilee. Uh, that was Matthew. In Mark, uh, we saw the part that is uh, common to our oldest manuscripts. That is the uh, original ending of Mark, or at least I believe that all the evidence is to that effect has the women going to the tomb. They're given a message by a young man who uh, presumably is an angel or could be an angel. But in any case, Jesus is not at the tomb. They're given a message that he has risen to go tell his disciples that he will see them in uh, Galilee again. And the women uh, flee from the tomb in fear and confusion. And it, it ends right there. And then we have a couple of endings that were later appended to mark a longer ending, a shorter ending. We'll get to those later. Um, when we got to Luke, we find women going to the tomb. Uh, they receive a message from two angels that Jesus had risen. There's uh, no message to give the disciples about going to Galilee as we did have in Matthew and Mark. Um, but the women relate that 
that, that they had this message uh, of Jesus having risen. The disciples were not inclined to believe what the women were saying. And then Luke then cuts to two disciples who were uh, traveling, uh, uh, walking north of Jerusalem toward another uh, village nearby. And Jesus approaches them without being recognized and has a conversation with them about uh, the recent events that have happened in Jerusalem, the crucifixion of Jesus and the report of the women that his body was not at the tomb and that he had been raised. So we ended um, when uh, it says in verse uh, 29 of Luke 24, um, it's the, the, as the end of the day is approaching, uh, they come to the village and it says in uh, verse, uh, yeah, it says in verse, we'll start in verse 28. It says, as they, the disciples with Jesus, uh, not rec recognizing that it's Jesus, but they approached the village where they were going and he, that is Jesus acted as though he were going farther, but they urged him saying, stay with us for it is getting toward evening. And the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he had reclined at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it, and breaking it, he began giving it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to one another, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? And they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found gathered together the eleven and those who were with them, saying, The Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon. They began to relate their experiences on the road and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of the bread. So uh, Luke has this interesting story about these uh, two disciples who are traveling. Uh, they only recognize that Jesus has been walking with them when he vanishes uh, at the end of the day, having gone in as he's breaking bread, he vanishes from them. They rush back to Jerusalem. And when they get back to Jerusalem, the other disciples are saying that Jesus had appeared in the meantime to Simon. Now, this would be uh, Simon Peter, also called Cephas. And there's a connection you might remember with our first passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where Paul says that he appeared to Cephas, then to all the apostles. Um, so uh, Luke uh, coincides nicely in that sense with what Paul says, that uh, Simon Peter or Cephas had seen Jesus uh, earlier than the rest of the disciples had. All right, so that brings us to, to uh, verse 36. The two disciples are now with the apostolic group and a few others, a few other disciples besides the 11 remaining. And it says in verse 36, while they were telling these things, he himself, that is Jesus, stood in their midst and said to them, peace be to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought that they were seeing a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they still could not believe it because of their joy and amazement, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it before them. Now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed to his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city, that is, city of Jerusalem, 
until you are clothed with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they, after worshiping him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising God. So there's the end of the Gospel of Luke, the appearances of Jesus. So we had uh, the women finding not the body of Jesus, but angelic messengers that send them back to the disciples. Uh, then we have the two disciples on the road to whom Jesus appears, uh, not recognized immediately, but recognized eventually. They rush back to Jerusalem the very same night. This is important. And they said it was the third day since the crucifixion. They go back to Jerusalem that night. And it says, while they are telling the other disciples of their experience, Jesus actually uh, stands in their midst. He appears right among them, shows them a, a, a body that has a, a physicality, that is, it can be touched. He even eats something, he eats a piece of fish. Then he gives them a commissioning message, which in many ways is similar to the commissioning message at the end of Matthew chapter 28. And then it says he leads them out of Jerusalem as far as Bethany, that's just very nearby to the uh, east of Jerusalem. And... Um, uh, you, you climb the Mount of Olives as you head toward uh, Bethany. And so it says uh, that Jesus at that point was carried up into heaven and was parted from them. Now, you might remember that um, in Matthew, the disciples go to Galilee and uh, uh, presumably that takes some time. You can't, in fact, uh, make that journey to Galilee in a single day. Uh, but they go to Galilee and see Jesus there. In Luke, it seems as though uh, Jesus speaks to the disciples on that very night, the night of the third day following the crucifixion. He speaks to them that very night, and the following morning they see him ascend into heaven. So does he return uh, from heaven in order to appear to the disciples later in Galilee? Well, that's a question we'll defer for right now, but we'll notice some differences between this account um, and uh, Matthew and Mark uh, over this question of where the disciples are going to see Jesus. In fact, in Luke, he tells them to stay in Jerusalem until they receive the Holy Spirit to carry out this commission for making disciples on a wider basis. But in any case, that's Luke. So keep in mind the, the basics of Luke. It's focused on Jerusalem, and on the commissioning of the disciples in Jerusalem, and then Jesus ascends. Matthew, on the other hand, commissioning in Galilee, and, uh, and there's no uh, narration of Jesus ascending. It just simply ends with his instructions. Now, we know that the author of Luke also wrote the book of Acts. And so instead of going on to John, because we have the same writer giving us more information in a second book, I want to turn to Acts and sort of piggyback that onto uh, the Gospel of Luke. Because in Acts, there is a, a little expansion, we might say, of, of what, is, uh, what is found at the end of the Gospel of Luke. And... Uh, well, not just believing scholars, but scholars generally, uh, the majority anyway, from, from the reading that I've done, and I don't pretend to be a scholar myself, but from the reading that I've done, I think it's safe to say that the majority of, of scholars, substantial majority, even those who are academic scholars, they may not even be believers, but most of them do believe that the author of the Gospel of Luke is also the author of Acts based on the uh, stylistic considerations and the comments in uh, Acts tying it to the Gospel of Luke. So we do uh, have all the indications uh, being that it's the same author. So in Acts 1, verse 1, and uh, we're going to read 1 through 11, this is, we might treat this as a kind of appendix or addendum to the Gospel of Luke, its account. 
of the resurrection appearances of Jesus. So it says, the first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach, uh, Theophilus being the person to whom Luke wrote the gospel and is now writing Acts. Okay, so verse two, uh, until the day when he, Jesus, was taken up to heaven, after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen, to these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which, he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. And after he said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. They also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. Uh, so uh, this is interesting additional material. There's an ad additional statement of the uh, uh, commission of the disciples to preach even to the remotest parts of the earth, indicating that uh, the time for Jesus' return in glory will be uh, significant. There's significant time involved since this, this preaching has to be done everywhere on earth uh, before that apparently can happen. And uh, also, uh, the author tells us here that Jesus made a series of appearances over 40 days. Um, and that seems to clash with the end of the gospel where his appearance is on the night of the third day and the following morning, and then he ascends into heaven, seemingly on that first occasion, not after an additional 40 days. Um, so we'll, we'll, again, that's one of those questions. We'll defer discussing it in detail. We'll just note it here uh, that even Luke has a little different timeline or different feel for the chronology of these resurrection appearances or multiple appearances as we um, uh, learn in Acts, he has a little different timeline in the beginning of Acts compared with the end of the gospel. All right, so uh, that brings us then to the fourth gospel, the gospel of John. And um, let's turn to John chapter, um, chapter 20, and uh, chapter 20 picks up in the same place really where Matthew uh, chapter 28 begins, where uh, Mark chapter 16 and uh, Luke chapter 24, they all begin with the, um, uh, the visit of the women, um, one or more, uh, at least two, um, according to Matthew, three and Luke, at least, um, where the women are going to the tomb, uh, something to do with the preparing the body, Matthew says, to look at the tomb, and then they find uh, the situation where the body of Jesus is not there. So I'll start reading. Again, this is John chapter 20. Start reading in verse 1 and make a few comments. Uh, this is our longest account of the resurrection appearances because it covers all of chapters 20 and 21, uh, reasonably long chapters of the Gospel of John. 
Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and said to the other disciple, whom Jesus loved, said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter and the other disciple went forth and they were going to the tomb. The two were running together, and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. And stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. And so Simon Peter also came, following him, and entered the tomb, and he saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the face cloth, which had been upon his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple who had first come to the tomb, and then also entered, uh, who had first come to the tomb, then also entered, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. So the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping, and so, as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white, sitting, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father, and my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came, announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. All right, so again, we have the women, or in this case, one woman definitely mentioned as going to the tomb and not finding Jesus and having an angelic encounter. There really isn't a, much of a message because the uh, one of the angels, the one that speaks to her, just says, uh, oh, why are you uh, why are you weeping? Uh, but uh, it is true that in John chapter 20, verse 2, Mary says <clears throat> that we do not know where they have laid him, seemingly, uh, or, or at least possibly indicating that there are other women with her who have not been mentioned. Uh, just that, that pronoun, we, unless she's referring to the group of the male disciples she's talking to, assuming that, that they don't have this information either, something like that. But otherwise, it's just indicating that since she's the focus, the others are not being actively described, but they but they are uh, present with her in the background. All right, so uh, we read that Jesus didn't find him. Uh, an angel uh, uh, speaks to her briefly, then she sees Jesus close by, having not recognized him at first. Uh, note how that's a little bit similar to a uh, uh, to Luke, where the two disciples did not recognize Jesus at first. All right, so that brings us to uh, verse 19. We'll read a couple more verses uh, since we have time now. We won't, uh, as I said, get all the way through this material. We'll finish it next time. So 19. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. 
The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails, and put my finger into the place of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. After eight days his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them, Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst, and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger, and see my hands, and reach here your hand, and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who do not see and yet believed, or excuse me, who did not see and yet believed. So verse 30, therefore many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. All right, so that's we're about halfway through uh, the resurrection appearance record in the Gospel of John. After that, we'll only have one more to go, the one outside the Bible from Josephus. Now, from our material uh, that we've seen so far, maybe if your uh, uh, memory is reasonably good and you've committed some of these details to memory, you can see that we have a considerable variance <laughs> in some of these stories. We have some, some definite common elements and some elements that run across all of them, even over into Paul's uh, original statement, 1 Corinthians 15, or his uh, statement that's the oldest one that we have access to. Uh, but there are some serious differences as well, and we're going to be getting into those uh, more after we can complete our initial survey. But I'll just say at this point, um, uh, the differences uh, are... Um, uh, are something that has to be addressed in recommending this material as evidence. Uh, and I think that once you start comparing even more closely, you'll notice more differences than you have already uh, noticed uh, in, in the casual reading that we've been doing, or the preliminary reading. Um, and uh, of course, those raise questions about the value of this material as evidence. If there are, I might say, surface contradictions, anyway, maybe they can be reconciled, but uh, they seem to be contradictions on the surface. Um, and uh, some, what would seem like some critical details that are present in one and not in the other, you wonder why that is. All of that can kind of uh, add up to a, a, a bit of disturbance in evaluating these as evidence. Uh, why don't they agree more closely, you might say. Well, we'll be taking that up. All I can tell you now is we will take a very hard look at these differences one by one and some of the strengths, uh, the apparent strengths on a, just a historical level, literary level, some of the strengths of these gospel accounts, as well as uh, some some weaknesses and some which are not apparent right away that we want to look at them but not stop with them because <laughs> if you just look at the uh, the surface uh, contradictions the apparent inconsistencies uh, some of the what look like weaknesses in the accounts as historical records if you just stop there you'll get a misleading picture it's very much like the story that we're reading, where when Jesus is crucified and the disciples were not prepared for that, it does not fit into the picture of the way they believed events would unfold. 
um, relating to Jesus. They thought he would take his throne in Jerusalem. And if you're, say, in the shoes of the disciples, uh, just after Jesus has been crucified, uh, things are looking pretty bleak at that point, but that's not the end of the story. And so when we look at these uh, accounts in greater detail, we see differences, important differences between them that uh, raises some concerns. However, we'll find that that too is by no means the end of the story. Um, and uh, so that will be uh, interesting to see, but we'll get to that in good time. So uh, you could read those accounts over again if you want to get their details more firmly in mind. Uh, for the moment, we're going to conclude and uh, we'll uh, end with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for allowing us to consider um, passages in uh, the Gospels and in Acts related to the resurrection of your son. We thank you for your guidance and your care during this difficult time of uh, a pandemic and many uh, suffering economic hardships or uh, health difficulties or maybe loss of loved ones. And, and, and so please, uh, by your spirit, uh, comfort and guide and protect all, all those who look to you for help and be with us. Uh, by your spirit until we meet again uh, in the future. Amen. And I'll see you next time.